sorry. Cool. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we'll be hearing today from Zochi, who is gonna introduce herself in just a minute, but she is um, a rising senior at UC San Diego and has led a, a similar creative development session um, for several other groups over the years. Um, so she's excited to share that with us and really take us through the process of, you know, what it is to be creative and how you don't necessarily have to be like in an art, like an arts major in order to have this sort of creativity. Um, so with that, Zochi, I'll hand you the reins and give you screen sharing ability. Great, thank you. All right, let's, so first, before I start screen sharing, and Mike and Jess know this, sometimes my Wi-Fi just decides to poop out. So if it does poop out, it'll take me about five minutes to get back in. Uh, your first exercise will be, um, why did Sochi leave? And it's wrong answers only. So that's, that's the emergency exercise if I did. <laughs> Can you guys see my screen? Cool, thank goodness. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks, Jake and uh, TA&ND for having me for this. I'm really excited. Um, this is called You Are Creative. Um, I've done this a few times for UCSD, um, and I've worked with, um, not worked with, but I've ran these kinds of ideas by a lot of other professionals before doing this. Um, so uh, just to, you know, make sure that I actually have like a kind of good idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I guess an example of you guys know Dave Crawford from WDI. Um, he's a right engineer over there. Um, I ran these ideas with him about a year ago and he helped me structure this a little bit better for an engineering uh, audience. Oh, this works for a creative audience too. Um, so I got some help from him. Um, him though, not WDI. He asked me to clarify that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, oh, I'm just gonna, there we go. Uh, background on me. Um, my um, my experience, wow, I can't speak today, uh, in the creative field comes from a lot of internships with Warner Brothers, and by a lot, I mean three. Um, I worked in Blue Room Content as a production intern for them before, a talent development in DC Comics where I helped them with one adult uh, artist showcase and 15 uh, children's graphic novels, and um, at special events and marketing last year, working on helping them plan events, take pictures, create graphics and such. Um, but I also have a lot of experience in haunts. I co-led the first Halloween maze at TAUCSD. Um, supervised the second one and technical directed it and technical directing this next one coming up. And uh, I've competed in a lot of competitions. I think six, might be going on seven right now. I'm gonna be honest, lost a little count. Um, got fourth place last year in Cornell and top 15 this year, so that's cool. Um, and the minor creative work in form eight here. And when I say minor, I mean really minor because uh, TA UCSD actually had a project with them to help them create their mazes and um, improve them for the 2019 season, which got canceled. And then we were brought back on for this year. And then that one got canceled too, because COVID. So yeah, but I'm going to be interning with that department this summer. Um, that was my original project. It got canceled because of COVID. So, and yeah, I have also the project director or one of them, because Mike's here too, uh, for STEP. So if you guys know what that is. Uh, yeah, that's where my background mostly comes from. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, what it really means to be creative and stuff. And before we get into that, we're going to do a quick exercise. It's, you're going to have about five minutes. Just work on your own. Um, and so this exercise is how would a superhero's life change during a pandemic? Uh, you can choose any superhero you want uh, and just like jot down some ideas like where did they fight crime? How would they uh, keep themselves safe while fighting crime, especially those who like, don't have a full on face mask? Um, what are kind of precautions would they take? Um, how does being a crime fighter in a pandemic affect their home life? That kind of stuff. Uh, just um, be as imaginative as you can and yeah, just see what you can come up with. You guys have five minutes. I'm gonna mute myself if you guys need that. All right, time is up. Um, so this was just a quick exercise, just so you can like get your minds moving. Oh, okay. Um, does anybody want to share what they wrote? I can share a little bit. 
All right, awesome. Jess, if you want to go, and then Josiah, you want to go after? So I was kind of thinking about it in terms of Justice League, because you had that big picture for Robin right there. And I was torn between having them all quarantined together, but then that would have made fighting crime really hard if one of them has to go out and then quarantine for two weeks and everything get back. So I just pictured poor Superman having to quarantine at the Fortress of Solitude. Oh. And having to, like, hard sanitize and, like, dive himself into the ocean to clean off every time he goes in, because I'm pretty sure it can, like, last longer in cold. And he's in a literal ice cave. Um, I wrote full face mask and gloves, but I think that's kind of a given in a lot of this. Uh, yeah. Oh, great job. Oh, Josiah. Yeah. I also went with Superman just because I think he's a pretty interesting hero, especially in the face of a obstacle he can't punch. You know, Superman is built for the physical violence, but this is not something that I think Superman himself is capable of just fighting. Um, he definitely would shift his focus from crime fighting to um, showing solidarity for people. So um, like Jessica said, wearing the blue mask and gloves to symbolize working with nurses. There was a article about how people were hoarding um, the hand sanitizers from Amazon and trying to price gouge them. And now that Amazon won't let them sell it and they can transport it, Superman would come in and transport all of those um, sanitary products to people in need, most likely um, inner cities, such like that. Uh, the big issue or the big tension in the, within the story would be how the public would receive Superman especially because there's this big notion that masks and <laughs> gloves are un-American and Superman is the ideal of the American spirit. So especially with Lex Luthor prodding and like goading the public into criticizing him, he would basically face a lot of backlash for trying to I don't know, spread propaganda. I think that's how the media would spin it. Eventually he would learn that Superman himself is not the idol people need right now. He would revert back to Clark Kent and that's where he can do the most good. He can use his journalism skills to raise awareness for the, you know, the truth behind the pandemic. He would be able to talk to essential workers as they kind of martyr themselves in grocery stores and stuff. And that's how that story would end. Just like in the sense of we don't need a superman. We don't need a superhero to solve this problem. We just need normal people all working together. Oh, you thought all that in like five minutes? Yeah. Um, like I said, I've been reading through a lot of Superman comics because he's a pretty interesting character. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these ideas, I'm sure, have been discovered from other artists and novels. Nice. Great job. All right, Mike, I see your hand up. Okay, let's do this. So I created a new uh, character, this superhero. Zephyr Gold. Zephyr Gold is a blimp who goes around fighting crime. But now during the pandemic, what is she gonna do? She is transporting that medical supplies. Yeah, you know it. She's going from hospital to hospital, moving things around. You know she's got screens, so she's enforcing those social distancing rules. There you go, going around spreading the good word fighting for social justice and your safety. Zephyr Gold in the coronavirus era. <coughs> Sorry, nice job. Snaps for that, snaps for that. Yeah. All right, is anyone else? Michael, it looked like you kind of raised your hand earlier. Oh, yeah, no, mine's just really short. I have a feeling, um, I did one for Spider-Man, which was basically he would like make masks out of webbing, to just give to people. Oh. I feel like that and uh, maybe just like re redistributing supplies, so. I like that, making masks out of webbing. I feel like it'd, it'd be so sticky that I would be so afraid of, I, I'm afraid of spiders, so like having them on my face, I'd probably be like, oh. But I, yeah. think I mean, he kind of does that already when he's fighting people, just like do that on a face. So just that, but like everywhere he, he just sees people, whether they- <laughs> Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I get what you mean now. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's great. I love that. Oh, and there go my dogs in the background. All right, good job, guys. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, so this is just a warm up to get like your brain moving as we are gonna go to a couple bigger exercises later, but let's, let's jump into what 
It means to be creative. So a common misconception that I've noticed, at least among the people I've worked with in the past, is that a lot of people think creativity is about being an artist and how well you can draw. Uh, that's not the case. Um, it's about problem solving. Um, so that being said, engineers are, are creative too. Um, and what do I mean by problem solving and what do I mean by engineers being creative? Um, well, in this industry, you're going to be put into unique situations that require unique solutions. Um, and so you need to know how to approach such challenges no matter your profession. Uh, so like think of it like you have to train your mind to think outside the box to or to just prepare. So when you get to a hyper specific problem, you are quick to your feet to, to adjust for it rather than to just give up. Um, so an example of this could be last year for our haunted house, we had this huge room where it was solely reliant on having a laser that would project a, a flat line across fog and make it look like there was water and we were gonna have scare actors jumping out of it. And then the day before the maze was supposed to open, uh, fire marshal said no. <laughs> so uh, we had less than 24 hours to figure out how do we change that. And so that would be an example of like, a, like a creative problem that you would have to solve. Like what props do you have? What could you, um, what can you make with the little time you have, the little props do you have? Um, how do you change the script to make sure that it, it fits in with the story still? Uh, how do you make sure that the scare actors are understanding that the story has changed and their new roles? And do you fully understand the new roles? Making sure it fully gets communicated, you have proper sound. Um, and I guess in the case we were in, we couldn't change the light, so we had to work with that too. Um, so yeah, something like that. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go into our second exercise, speaking of haunted houses. Um, you guys might remember this one from a different creative workshop, except we've changed it a little bit. Um, usually I like to do the first one as a haunted house, just because I love haunted houses. So uh, if you're a project manager for a carnival themed haunted house, the day before the maze is supposed to open, the fire marshal informs you that your pitch black room is unsafe due to a canopy structure, a closed structure being indoors. You hung stuff from the canopy to scare deaths in the dark. Without the canopy, you must find a new way to make scares in a dark room. What do you do? So explain this room a little bit further. Um, this is based off a real scenario that we actually face as well. Um, you, what happens, you are in a room and in that side of that room, you have a line of canopies that you hung like strings and sticky hands and other things from. So when guests walk through, they couldn't see that they just felt stuff hitting them and tickling them. But now you don't have that anymore. The creative director in this scenario will not let you have anything else other than a dark room, but you don't really have stuff to hang there. So what kind of scares can you create using um, any kind of props you can think of? Just nothing hanging from the ceiling. Let's, in this scenario, the ceiling is way too high. Um, so, um, when you're doing this, um, please include the general story of the room and how it fits with the theme. Uh, why is it an open dark space here um, in this creepy carnival? At least three props placed so guests don't just walk in a straight line like I have here, they have to zigzag. Um, at least one scare actor, a description of the sound you'd use, and a quick layout sketch just saying this is prop one, this is prop two, this is prop three. Um, also, I'm going to send you all this information so you don't have to screenshot or anything. So I'm going to pull that up. But I see Josiah, you have a question. Oh, no, I didn't understand the prompt. I had an idea, but since we're all doing it. Okay, so let me. Sorry, you guys are going to see my screen for a second. Um, why can't I? And all my. The control bar's in the way, so I can't actually see it. There we go. Also, I'm going to put you guys in the groups or Jake is gonna put you in the groups. So let me pull this up How big do you want these groups to be? Let's see, um, four to five people. Oh wait, well there's, I guess four people each. Sounds good. Three people each, there's nine people, yeah. <laughs> um, let me, where'd the control bar go? There it is. And I still can't, I don't know why it's not letting me send it. Um, if it's dark room, how are they supposed to see the props? That's just a good point. You know they're there. Why do they make sense that they're there? I'm gonna try this again with this link. Okay. 
So you should be able to access the Google Doc from there that has the instruction. It does have the instruction from the other exercise we're going to do later on as well, but try not to look if you can resist. Uh, so uh, it also has your layout on there, so you can just draw directly on there. Um, and I'm going to stay in the main room, so if you need anything, you can ask me questions or just have somebody message me. Um, yeah, that's pretty Ready. much it. We're good to go. All right. Good job, y'all. Do you, do you all want to share your work? I mean, I'll go first and no one else will. All right. So um, picture this. Um, the hallway itself isn't lit by anything in the room. There's ambient lighting coming in from either front or back entrance, okay. such that when you walk in, all you see are a bunch of balloons um, tied, anchored to the floor. You kind of have to walk through them and get that same similar kind of pushing through things by we were going for it. But mm -hmm. this obstructs your view until you pass them by. And in front of you, you see the storage room for the carnival. Um, mm -hmm. Along each wall, you have all the old decaying prizes, the like bug-eyed teddy bears, the um, really weird snake things just hanging on the wall, staring at you. Around scattered are the um, broken down horses from the carousel, eyes wide open, missing legs kind of like chipped up. And um, in the back, there are the carnival games that are kind of just dilapidated. However, this doesn't catch your attention. What does is the creepy um, jack-in-the-box kind of music um, that slowly fills the room. And as you walk towards the back, you do see a large jack-in-the-box, the handle spinning by itself. Um, it's halfway through the song now. It's too late to leave. But as you go to leave, and step in front of the jack in the box, the sound stops. As your group looks at this box, what's wrong with it? It must be broken. A voice behind you says, what do you think inside it? And you realize the clown is standing behind you, also waiting in anticipation. And that's the scare. Hmm. Nice job. Um, just like to say, I really like your storytelling. You <laughs> very much built up the anticipation so nice job on that thank you um, I, I had a question for you so what what's anchoring or like setting up the balloons um all the top of my head i'm imagining we can easily get some pvc um mm -hmm. drill some holes in them and then or not even drill holes just take a screw mm -hmm. um and put screws in this pvc mm -hmm. and then lay it down flat this way, the ropes themselves are kind of anchored in positions on the pathway, mm -hmm. but we don't we don't have a chance of guests tripping over it. If that makes sense. That makes sense. Great, good job. It was you and who else was on? Was, did you? Have uh, Amanda Ornoff, Corbin Carlson, and Kyle Wilson. Super nice. invaluable to process. Yeah, well, nice job to all four of you. Oh, you hear my dogs in the background. I'm sorry, but yeah, great job. I really liked it. Uh, I really like the chat use of the jack in the box and the balloons and making them zigzag through. So nice. All right, other team. Ready? Uh, should, should I do it or does anyone want to? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Go for it, okay, Michael. All right, go. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So for our team, we decided to go with uh, making the area themed to. Uh, the stables where you would keep animals, uh, more specifically horses. And uh, our main story element behind it was that uh, the horses ate these rotted apples and they started going crazy. So when you first enter the uh, hallway, there's a hay, a hay bale on the left with some where you see some like rotted apples kind of on top of. So you kind of get a sense of like, oh, what's going on? And as you walk through, the sound effect is like the squish of the rotted apples. You're not going to be squish there's not going to be real ones on the floor so you're not going to actually get your shoes messed up uh mike actually came up with a really good idea for a sound effect where you just take uh mulch and you uh dip it in uh water and then you use that kind of as something to like squish on to kind of like simulate that effect and then there's also a hay kind of on the floor a little bit here just kind of add some mood and then 
when you get past up when you pass the uh, hay bale on the, the left, there's a stable on the right that you have to right after that that you have to kind of be around too. And it's a person wearing a horse costume, pretending to be a horse, and they're uh, trying to scare you. Uh, we didn't come up with exactly with dialogue or anything. They just like try and like ah. So uh, I kind of drew up a little sketch of uh, the hallway. So there's like uh, two hay bales right there. This is kind of where I was thinking the stables would be. And then here you have uh, definitely a real horse and not a person in a horse suit. And uh, yeah, that's basically our setup. Uh, did I miss anything from anyone from a group or are we good? Nope, that sounds pretty darn good. Okay. <laughs> This, the mulch idea like I feel like if I was someone going through that I couldn't see and I felt stuff start squishing I would like freak out and try to run like and like no I don't know what this is. So, I love that the smell probably too that would probably really contribute to the room um, and make it just like so uneasy so I really like that aspect of it and like I horse stable I didn't even consider that with this so like I love well, the I'll be honest I definitely read redo as rodeo <laughs> so that's where the horse idea came from <laughs> nice um all right i'll start sharing my screen again um, sorry so as i mentioned last year we had a similar problem we had a third party rental company come in and set up canopies for us and they had a document that said you can't set up canopies inside the buildings at ucsd but they did it anyways. And so we found out like a day or two later from the fire marshal that it wasn't allowed and that the people who did it and charged us for it knew fully well it wasn't allowed. Um, I worked for the venue, so I got to spend that day taking down the, the canopies, uh, which also weren't structured that well. One of them like actually fell on my boss, which isn't great. Um, and what we ended up doing was leaving the skeleton of it up and kind of hanging stuff from it, but we couldn't hang too much from it. Uh, throwing pine needles on the floor so that when you walked, it sounded like you were going through part of the forest and you just heard a bunch of crunching and popping, uh, played loud sounds through our soundtrack. And um, what was the last thing we did? Oh, we had strip lights on the floor that were really dim to make sure people knew just to go straight forward. Um, that is to the extent that we did with that room because as I mentioned, we had an issue with the other room too. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Nice job, y'all. Um, yeah, I guess, what did you learn? What are some challenges that you faced? I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. I'll say yeah. one thing. I had this great idea for making the people walk on rotten apples and people brought up, you know, like you probably shouldn't put rotten apples on the floor to make people walk through. Mm -hmm. um, so that was definitely a challenge, but it was kind of a good opportunity to explore like how to still create that same emotion for the mm -hmm. guests walking through without, you know, actually damaging their property essentially yeah that's a good point because like, yeah that is a challenge like well, how do you make rotten apples and make sure also like they don't slip <laughs> i guess but you guys have made a great idea with the mulch um and yeah this is i already said this but yeah this, this, this was supposed to just get you in the mindset of creating uh problem solving in um problems that could come up and you only have a short amount of time to do it and just to like prep you for events or situations like this. Um, okay, so these next two slides had to pertain with the last um, exercise, but I wanna give you all a choice. So this, this was talking about what themed entertainment is and how COVID has changed it. And then we were gonna do a COVID related exercise. And then last night, my sister showed me a, sna a, a TikTok where somebody, as a parody, decided to redo Buzz Lightyear and to, if you, any of you have seen um, Good Luck Charlie, they themed it off of the dad, Bob Duncan, and it was like, Bob's bu Bugs Be Gone Blasters. <laughs> and I thought it was really funny and it, it's, a, I have it linked here. I don't know if it's gonna let me play it or if it's gonna time me out. So I'm gonna finish explaining and then I'll try to play it. Um, but our two options is to do the COVID one or to do the parody of Buzz Lightyear one. So y'all could vote and choose. But 
but let's see if we can get this. I'll vote for retheming the ride personally. Is anybody against it? I'm I'm cool with that, but I'll also say the guy has a great one on uh, retheming uh, one of the rides to Radio Rebel. Oh my God! Really? <laughs> yeah, it's um. I think it's um. Smugglers Run, but everybody's just uh, Debbie Ryan. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, this is, is this not gonna load? Okay. Um, so we're just gonna, let me see if I can, oh, no, okay. Well, I'll try to send you all the links somehow. Then we'll do retheming a ride. So for this next exercise, you're gonna be retheming Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters in Disneyland. Um, how You need to keep the same layout, um, general location, ride vehicle, and shooter type game. Uh, this ride must be a parody such as the one I just mentioned. It doesn't have to be Disney friendly if you don't want it to be. Um, so <laughs> there's that. Um, so please include a storyline, the plans for the ride and queue environment, um, you know, what the guests feel, what they experience. Plans for that final room. For those of you who know the ride, the one where the final room with Zerg um, is like where you're defeating Zerg essentially. A ride name and bonus points for any kind of like sketches or concept art you can come up with. Um, yeah. Um, is there anybody who hasn't ridden this ride or is unfamiliar with this ride? Okay, we're gonna keep it then. If anybody is unfamiliar with it, not comfortable with it, go ahead and message me and we'll figure something out. Um, although if you don't know it, I'm sure your teammates can catch you up real quick. But um, yeah, so that's gonna, we're gonna do the same thing um was 10 minutes a good amount of time or would you y'all like more time less time 10 was good it was good all right then we're gonna do 10 minutes again you can still see my screen whoops um uh jake would you mind breaking us up into breakout rooms again yes. perfect and i'm going to try to link that TikTok onto that document i shared with y'all earlier so i will be doing that right now keep your eye out for it um so we'll see you back here at six Hello and welcome back. Oh my God, Jake and Mike, I don't know what y'all are up to. <laughs> oh my God, Josiah, you too. <laughs> and Jess, oh my God. Oh no, that's not, that y'all are up to no good. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go first here. We'll go first. Josiah, you want to start us off with the story? with us oh okay um so oh my God. we we um not gonna lie we spent a lot of time deliberating we had some fantastic ideas but the one we all decided on eventually unanimously was <laughs> um the name is mike metal shop maniac and the story is how mike sturman grew from a boy to a man so he was telling us this life story, you know, he was very much into this idea. And um, he mentioned that he welded and like that was one of his big things in high school. So I'm like, wait a minute, we have a perfect ride system for welding. As you step on the vehicle, you are handed a, um, it's a, to a blow torch. I I'm not. Yes. <laughs> I'm not as cool as Mike. So um, the gun is not shaped like a blow torch. And as you go through the ride, you are now welding pieces of metal as you ride, starting from in the shop at school to the newest ride at Disneyland. Because this is his story from how he grew into the themed entertainment industry. The finale um, is you and all of your friends kind of working together to build the newest, um, fastest, most thrilling roller coaster at Disneyland while you're on it in a very much Phineas and Ferb style way. You're walling all the way up um, the nice tunnel. And as you um, just pop down into the gift shop, you realize you've come out of this, it changed me. And so um, for the queue line experience, we're imagining it's like a timeline on the ground. So as you're walking through the queue, right? June 30th, 2001, you see that printed on the like, into the floor embedded in the concrete right before you enter. And so then as you're going, like, 
you're taking this journey of Mike through his life. And so like on the wall, it'll say like first day of kindergarten, right? With the date on the ground and you like keep following the lines and it takes you through like first day at Disneyland, like first, you know, like his first time riding like Tower of Terror and like all of the like milestones of life. And then the other, the like technology we're going to build into it as well is kind of where like they show you your scores now. They're going to also show like on Haunted Mansion where like a ghost will sit in the car with you, but now instead it'll project like a beard just like Mike's onto everybody's face <laughs> as they ride by. <laughs> I think that's all we got. And, and the gift shop. The gift oh, shop sells <laughs> pictures, beards, um, these fine glasses, if you see right here. Of course, yeah. And, mm, and of course, you know how like Spider-Man has the statues of Spider-Man you can buy at the end of the ride for like $3,000. Same thing here. With our <laughs> I should not talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Y'all are like... on record. I do not condone this. This is not. Uh, <laughs> you do. Not Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Y'all really went for it. I love <laughs> I all they really went for it. I just kind of sit and watch. <laughs> you have the background on. You're, you're a part of this. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just did that. I didn't expect that. <laughs> um, great job, y'all. You've definitely weren't afraid to step outside the box with that, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> All right, I'm, just, I'm gonna keep laughing. That's the, the, the next group want to go. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, wait, Danielle, you came up with the name, so do you want to like? All right, because okay. I'm real proud of this yeah. one. Yeah, you got it. So this one is going to be called uh, Agent P's Perilous Predicament. So as you can can tell it's based off of uh, an interaction between uh, Agent P and Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Um, so basically, you've been recruited by Major Monogram to join uh, Alka to become a secret agent and uh, help parry the platypus defeat Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Um, so we have like a couple of drawings first. Oh my god, it's so bad. But you have you kind of have like your line cue, and it's based off of Agent P's lab. So you're kind of going through, and, and major monogram is is where uh, um, the Buzz Lightyear is currently, and he's kind of describing, okay, like here's your task, et cetera, et cetera. And Michael, do you want to show uh, your drawing? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm just gonna kind of hold this up to the screen. If you kind of look closely, like this is supposed to be the queue, which is not drawn well, but basically it's supposed to be riding on one of like Oka's vehicles. And that's right when you get like the dooby dooby doo wah dooby dooby doo wah, like right as you're joining in right before you speak to Major Monogram. And then right when the ride starts, this is supposed to be, I tried drawing Doofenshmirtz where he's basically like, ah, I'm not gonna try doing the impression cause I can't, but basically he's saying, ah, I hear you're friends of Perry the platypus. Now behold, all of my innators. So he brings out, all the innators, all the big guns. So you're just the whole ride. You're just aiming at all of his innators. So this could be like anything from any previous episode. It can be like, so yeah, that's basically what the ride is. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Wait, Danielle, yeah. do you want to take it from here? Yeah. And then there's also, there's also, you know, there's the room where it's almost like a giant screen and you're in the like galaxy. And then there's like this, uh, um, this machine that's moving back and forth. So instead of that, it'll be like almost like a GIF, if you will, of Agent P and um, Dr. Doofenshmirtz having this battle. So you get to try to like blast like Dr. Doofenshmirtz. And then at the end, he's like, curse you, Perry the platypus. And then at the end where you have everybody's scores, it'll just show like what level of agent you've achieved. So uh, I, I just really want there to be like Planty the Plotted Plant like that's like one level like that's just baseline <laughs> but yep that would have to be the highest level though oh oh yeah actually yeah because nobody could beat planty the potted plant curse you planty the potted plant <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> i actually love that idea so much yeah. yeah and this actually 
this is actually stemmed out of Michael was saying he really wanted to do a error, but with Doofenshmirtz's building instead, because uh, it also just has like a similar shape. So that's how he came to it. I secretly just want to make um, Disneyland and all the parks just all Phineas and Ferb. That's like <laughs> hmm. the Phineas and Ferb ride. The Phineas and Ferb, the agency affection is going away. Yeah. Like how in that one TikTok you were showing, it was just the guy wanting to make the land all Bob Duncan. I want to do that, but just do things <laughs> Brilliant. Lots of me. Yes, there are lots of me. There's lots of me. Remember that episode of Phineas and Ferb? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, where he clones himself. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I just want to say, I want this to be a real attraction. I think you all like thought that out really well and like it fit perfectly. And also, I really appreciate your sketches too. Um, so, I, I mean, I love Fadine and Ferb, so I'm, of course, a little biased that I would very much want to see this in the parks. Um, yeah, great job. Um, I, I really love the direction y'all took it, and I, I really want to go defeat Dr. Doofenshmirtz. <laughs> I'm going to share the my park. We'll just walk around. <laughs> Secret agents. Um, so we already did this. Um, I guess, what did you learn? What, are, what were some challenges you faced? This is fun. I think at least for me, just having to use a pre-existing ride system that kind of limited what you can tell or what stories like work well with it. Um, that's why- Especially because the ride systems are pretty like particular, you know, like you're sitting there with a gun on like your ship. So it kind of limits like the stories you can tell, I think, mm -hmm. which is good for like pushing you outside the box. I think like, along that line, it's like, how do you try, how do you make something that doesn't fit in with the ride system so it doesn't feel like you're just taking it over and you're pretending to be like just another iteration of Buzz Lightyear? Some really good points, but yeah, as, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sony, I Mike. learned that I need to be careful with um, who I give my photos to um, <laughs> and who I let use my name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how to distribute intellectual property, my own intellectual and property. You know, I have to be careful with that. This one was on you. We, we literally talked about this for five minutes before you gave us this photo. <laughs> photo. That's a great photo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, why? why <laughs> no, just, my Zoom is now being held in like one top corner and I don't know how to get that. Mm. Uh, it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up anyways. Um, but yeah, I chose this ride because of the Omni Mover system and just the difficulty of it. Just of how it seems so simple with the what it got what it fits in with. Uh, sorry, I can't speak today. Um, but and as you guys mentioned, it's kind of tied with the theme and like what it was made to be for. So trying to make sure to make it but not overlay it where you can still tell it was buzz is a challenge. That's why I chose this ride. Also. That ride has a like is near and dear to my heart because when I saw that animatronic Buzz Lightyear as a kid standing in the queue, that like blew my mind. It was like the first like kind of instinct of like I want to make stuff like that. I just was like, whoa, it's Buzz talking to me, this big old toy. So yeah, there's that too. Oh, um, so in to close up the to close up the um workshop, you are creative. Um. Creativity is about problem solving and everyone has to problem solve in this industry. So, and you all have, as you showed today, you have and you have the brain power to do it. Um, so yeah, you're all creative and um, you have to be to work in this industry. Even as an engineer, you're gonna have problems with stuff that you're building or uh, timelines or teamwork and you're gonna have to figure out creative solutions um, to solve those. So how do you better prepare for that kind of stuff when you get to the uh, workplace? Doing little exercises like this on your own or with other people will greatly benefit your problem solving school skills and therefore your creative skills. Uh, if you want more creative exercises, um, let me know and I can put some together and send them out to y'all or to also send you the ones we've done in previous workshops. Um, and also 
to keep going with creativity, things don't happen overnight. Um, uh, the ones we did today were very quick on the spot things, but sometimes you need to, you need time to develop your ideas. So sometimes it's as much as starting something, taking a break, going back to it, taking a break, getting feedback, taking a break, doing it again, and just repeating. Or sometimes it's just a matter of writing the first word on the page or searching or making, wow, I don't know where that word came from, <laughs> making the first sketch line. Uh, one thing I learned in my theater class earlier this year uh, was my professor made us um, do napkin sketches for Romeo and Juliet's set ideas. And he made us all take a piece of paper and he was like, okay, draw an X in the middle. And so we did, and he was like, there you go, you've made the first mark on your page. And I, it actually kind of made things easier. So it's sometimes it's just a matter of uh, making that first sketch line, uh, writing that first word, uh, making that first CAD line, um, stuff like that. And it's gonna take trial and error and redoing and uh, redoing and revising, and, and that will help you in the end. Um, but also have those crazy ideas, those often lead to the best thing. An example I want to use is Foggy City, which was my um, Cornell submission last year. One time randomly in a meeting, one of our teammates was like, well, what if we just do noir? And we were just throwing random ideas out there. We were like, oh, a noir park? And so we decided to do noir park. And then we kept, we couldn't figure out the story of the ride, of why there were spies versus PIs on this ride. And so the, our teammate just randomly was like, what if it's a restaurant feud between two brothers? And um, it's a, one's a seafood restaurant and one has the first chocolate chip cookie recipe and they got to hide it. And we were like, wait, 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 backtrack it. And this was after an hour deliberating and we wrote it down and we flushed it out even more. And that actually ended up being our right concept and it worked. It worked for a family friendly park. So have those crazy ideas. No ideas are bad and it's going to help you in the long run. And that goes to my next point. Um, don't be afraid to be wrong. Uh, as you work, your ideas are gonna change and that's okay. That's growth. Um, and finally, uh, be okay with taking feedback. And there, that's, oh, and giving feedback as well. That's gonna help you improve and better develop your problem solving skills and like help other people too. Um, but if you wanna keep, like keep your creative muscles going, um, here's some books I really recommend. Um, this one, Car the first one Carson mentioned on Tuesday as well, Theme Park Design, The Art of Theme Entertainment. It's this big book I have right next to me. Um, it's a textbook basically of theme entertainment. And if you're really interested in theme entertainment, it's a little, it's a little bit on the steeper side in price, but it's highly recommended. I've learned a lot from it. Think of the most boring textbook you've had and replace all of that with theme entertainment stuff. Cause this is, this is what this is. And it's really cool. Um, another one, Follow the Story, The Foundation of Every Great Attraction by Scott Swenson is another great one that talks about how you develop a story. Um, I have found it really helpful and that one's pretty cheap and he's a really nice guy. I met him in Iapa. And then these next two books kind of go in pair. The Imaginary Way uh, talks about how to get your creative muscles going and it's written by a bunch of Imagineers and the Imaginary Workout exercises to shape your creative muscles. It's literally, I think like a hundred pages and each page is a different creative exercise. And finally, the Imagineering Pyramid. Uh, this is actually a series. And the guy talks about how um, to take the concepts of Imagineering and uh, apply them to different parts of your life and those creative processes that they use. So I highly recommend those. Um, other than that, that's it. If y'all have any questions for me, let me know. Um, just find me on LinkedIn or on the Discord if you're on the Discord. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me, Jake, and all of you at TAND. I had a lot of fun doing this, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. <laughs>